All right. Welcome to World 101X. And we're here with Professor Chris uh, Shaw from the University of Auckland. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, one question we always ask everyone who comes on is, how did you become interested in anthropology? Or what was your pathway to anthropology? Oh, OK. Uh, that's going back a long time. The honest, well, one of the honest answers is I, I started out at university doing modern history and politics. I, politics was my passion, and I loved it. And I, I thought I saw on a career as a sort of political advisor or a researcher. And um, after doing that for about six months, it was so utterly boring <laughs> that I dropped out of university, went and worked for a year. And, um, but then when I came back, I wanted to do something a bit more interesting. And I, I'd never really heard of anthropology, but I enrolled in a course which was modular. And I did anthropology and geography. And it fired me up. I just got, you know, I thought, wow, this is it. This is the subject I want to do. Mm -hmm. But there's another, there is another kind of caveat to, to that answer is that I got in, I've always been interested in other worlds, other people's lives. Um, and I knew from quite an early age that it, it's not just, you know, individuals who have different lives, but there's a kind of real cultural pattern. And for me, it was, um, it was actually class. I grew up in London central in inner London and I, I went to um, I went to this big inner London comprehensive school all boys rough as guts uh, 2000 all boys crammed into this sort of small space quite violent and but I came from a kind of quite a middle-class family uh, where my both my parents had gone to university Cambridge and they spoke in you know we spoke with <laughs> words that had more than three syllables but at school, it was like the, the, the culture was that you, you know, you'd be beaten up if you spoke in a posh accent. So I, I realized that there were two kinds of, two ways of being. You know, one was that the school culture was rough. You talk with a South London accent, mate, and all that. And then at school where you, you it was okay to, to speak in a sort of different, with a different register and voice. I hadn't heard of Basil Bernstein and all that stuff in, you know, in educational theory and mm. there, but that was, it really triggered me to um, this, this idea that, you know, people occupy different worlds, and you don't even have to go abroad. It's in your own, in Britain in particular, yeah. class is culture. Mm. So for your, that was your undergraduate work, yeah. geography and, and anthropology. Yeah. For your graduate work, what, what, what did you do? Well, I, at the end of the, the third year of my uh, undergraduate course, we had to do a dissertation, and I had a really inspiring anthropology teacher who, who it was called, it was the anthropology of the Mediterranean, which what blew me out of, of the water, I, this, this is the Mediterranean, I was in Britain, it, it wasn't very far away geographically, mm. but culturally, historically, socially, it was a completely weird and strange place, you know, Mediterranean kind of ideas about honour and shame, different development, whole history of colonisation, um, agricultural communities, and so I did a little bit of field work living in a small island in, off, uh, in the lagoon of Venice for my Lovely. third year dissertation. It was <laughs> nice. It was, it was quite you know, scary. I was on my own. I didn't speak Italian, but I lived there for about six weeks. And I, after that, I thought I got really interested in, you know, here was a, a small island, but you had two institutions that dominated it. One was the Catholic Church, Italy, you know, Venice, 2,000 years of Catholic history. The other was the Communist Party. Mm. Italy, biggest communist party in, in Western Europe, in the Western world, had two million members at that time. So I thought, oh, this would be really interesting. So I wrote a you know, research proposal, and um, as, as I was talking to Fern earlier, I, I got offered a, a, a scholarship, a PhD scholarship at Sussex University. So it was a no-brainer. You know, <laughs> three years of money, chance to do field work in Italy. What's well, not to like? So I, I opted for that and uh, never looked back. So then you kept on following that project for your further research and did it expand or develop beyond what you'd expected beyond the experiences that you'd have over those six weeks yeah well I, I, I originally my PhD was a study of what happens in the relate you know what how do these two ideological systems connect do, do communists and Catholics live in the same space because the theory at the time was that these are not serious ideological divisions but I, so I went to a, at the time um, very few people had done serious anthropological field work in big cities it, it was all you know anthropology at that point was all peripheral communities peasants fishermen and so on but the the, the new cutting edge was urban anthropology and political movements mm. so i went and my, i chose a city that had a university had about 150,000 people and had a middle class and 
I, and I followed it there. I was originally trying to study the Communist Party and the Catholic Church, but after six months, I, I realised I couldn't be in both places at the same time because these people didn't like each other. <laughs> they, they didn't connect, <laughs> and it was a real conflict of loyalties. If I was sort of out there supporting my friends in the, the local Communist Party, you know, they, I was I would be told off by the. The Catholic, they were this born again Catholic movement. They're very, very sort of radical, and they they supported the Christian Democrats. They were all in favour of Pope uh, Wojtyla, uh, and, and they, you know, they thought that celibacy was great. And anyway, so I changed my fo research focus while I was doing fieldwork, and I just thought, well, I'll just write about the, the organisation of this party, and, and with the question, well, what does it mean to be a communist in Italy? And I realised that it, it wasn't the same as Soviet Russia, and these people had. A, their own theory about the state, about society, and, and they had their own, they had Gramsci, oh, you know, I, I wanted to read Gramsci, and I did, you know, that, that, so that was great. And so I finished my PhD, wrote a book about Italian communism, and um, then got kind of bored with the subject, so when I eventually got a job teaching anthropology, be between then, it was about sort of five years, I, I did various jobs, but one of them was I worked as a, a researcher, a political researcher for the European Parliament, first in Luxembourg, and then again, I worked for the socialist group of the, of, um, in the European Parliament in Brussels, so in their kind of exec, and I was a research assistant. And that was, I thought that was the job I wanted to do. So I had this kind of inside view of the, the institutions of the European community. And I always thought at the time, this place is amazing. You know, you've got, you've got um, Spanish, Italians, uh, Greeks, Germans, Danes, Brits, French, all trying to create a common civil service. Uh, how do you do it? You know? mm. And that, so years later, I got some money and I went back and um, did a, some serious field work in Brussels. And so that, that became my next big field work project. I wrote a book about the, the EU civil service and its tensions and you know, the factions and, and, and how you forge a, a, a supranational administration. It's a fascinating um, ethnography of an institution a multinational, multicultural institution. Yeah. But how, how, how did it differ in terms of field work, conducting field work in a, in a town, which is still yeah. very, you know, anthropology-wise, quite, quite traditional, going to one place? And how does it relate to an institution where people from all over different places have come together mm -hmm. to work rather than to live? But they also live there, uh, at least for some of the time. So what, what was kind of the main difference or the main that you identified in terms of doing field work in such different places? Well, it was really hard because of that, there was no, no textbook, no method. No, mm. When you're doing traditional field work, you've got a year, I had 18 months, and it's a contained space. So after 18 months, I, I knew everybody. And you could, what is it, you know, Marcus called it, deep hanging out, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love yeah. that expression. Um, so you can just be there in situ, and everyone, you can see, trace the connections. but. When you're trying to study up, to use that phrase of Laura Nader's, and you're trying to do an, an anthropology or an ethnography of institutions, these are really busy people. You know, if they, they wear suits and you know and ties and and uh, and they're you know urgently. You have to get past their secretary or their you know desk administrator to book a time in their uh, in their busy schedule to give you half an hour or, or an hour to, to talk. And um, so the challenge was to to get an in, to find a, a foothold, and um, I did it through, I mean, just through hard work, um, foot slogging, and what they call the snowball method. I, you know, once I got to know uh, some people, and I, I found that normally I'd say to people, I'd write to them in advance, say, you know, I'm living in Brussels, I'm doing this research, I'd just like to ask you a few questions, I know you're really busy, uh, if you have half an hour. And once I got a foot in the door, half an hour, I mean, a couple of times it turned into three and a half hours, you know, people, they, I, I discovered early on in my fieldwork that if you ask people about themselves and about their jobs, it's, it's kind of therapy for them. They love it. Because <laughs> not many people, you know, if you're a bureaucrat in an office you, and you often wonder... That's about what you do every day. Exactly. This is what we do every day and we don't feel valued and nobody really understands what we do. But you have this, you know, this researcher who, who is actually in, really genuinely interested and asks good questions and follows through. Then, oh, you know, they open up. And they did. So I, you know, I must have talked to well hundreds of people in the end. But, but that was the way. And it wasn't. I mean, I did get a, a pass that I could move around the the buildings and the institutions. But 
I didn't have, it was hard if you don't have a reason to be there. I wasn't shadowing anybody. I, I wasn't an intern. I mean, that would be the other way to try and do it, mm. to become a stagiaire. But then you get that kind of conflict of interest and you know, ethics committees might not like that. So, mm. I mean, just as a current, it's a course on current world issues. One of the current world issues is Brexit. Um, you, 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 studied, you, studied, you studied the institution that um, many people in the UK blamed for mm. what was going wrong in the UK. Um, yeah. Do you have any insights on, on how that attempt to create a supranational body, yeah. uh, bodies, yeah. um, didn't, hasn't worked out and hasn't translated to, to voters uh, in, in the UK at least. Yeah, I, well I do actually. I, I mean, I, so I wrote a book that was published in 2000, it was called Building Europe, the Cultural Politics of European Integration. And the book was partly field work on partly account of, of the, uh, the European Commission, but partly it was a, a critique of the, the grand narrative, the big project, we are going to build, construct a new Europe, which at the time, I mean, my book came across as quite a critical work. But you know, if you're doing serious social research, it, you know, and, and you don't want to just do hagiography or praise, it, it's got to be, it's got to have a critical edge. Mm -hmm. And my critical edge was, I warned that this project was based on non-democratic foundations. It was an elite project that was, you know, based on the, the assumptions of, of you know, high modernity, uh, run by good thinking, you know, forward progressive people from the post-war era. But way out of touch with public sentiment and they put the the structures in place before they had the democratic mandate and so you know the famous democratic deficit that everyone talked about was there and at the time that i was doing my field work the one big initiative that was taking place was the the invention of the single currency so i i was in this privileged position where i interviewed and got to know all the people who had been assigned the task of selling the euro, the single currency, to a sceptical public. And Germany was more sceptical than anyone because they had the Deutschmark had been the, the one single symbol of Germany's post-war mm. national success. And they were reluctant to give it up and merge it into a, mm. the EQ, as it was first called, and then the euro. Um, but I did realize, that, I mean, I, I'm not an economic anthropologist, but I, I had to learn some econo basic economics. And I realized that trying to create political union through economic and monetary policy was a really high risk strategy because mm -hmm. you you know you haven't got the, the, the cultural legitimacy you don't have people saying this is a good project we're behind it and if it goes wrong we're going to dip into our pockets and pay and at the time i remember reading lots of economists including serious economists on in the on the central committee of the of the bundesbank like otmar ising they warned that the system will get into deep trouble if there are external shocks. And, and the, the, the example that was always given was, what will happen if Portugal goes bankrupt? That, that, that was Port the metaphor. Portugal, yeah. It was always Portugal, small country. People in Portugal, the, the, the economy goes belly up. Uh, there's high unemployment, you know, serious balance of payments crisis. Will German tax pay, uh, payers, Dutch tax payers, fork out to look after their colleagues, their, their fellow citizens? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, well, not really. I mean, there's, you know, what, what's the cultural basis for that? And so the EU, the argument was the EU needed to have these big funds, structural funds, reserve funds that they would tap into. Well, in the event, it was Greece, not Portugal, that became the, the litmus of what happens when a country, you know, high borrowing, then the, the, you know, the the bubble bursts mm -hmm. and the country, it, it, to all intents and purposes, goes bankrupt. And the result was not that, that we saw, you know, that um, Finnish and, and Dutch and German taxpayers, there was a limit to how much they were going to, they weren't going to bail out Greece. So the creditors came in and said, right, you know, austerity, this is what you have to do, cut your public debt, um, reduce your, your, your bloated civil service, uh, raise taxes, no more public spending, pensions get cut. The, world, the state shrinks, and, and it's basically the transference of the structural adjustment policies that we saw that damaged India and, and uh, Africa and Latin America in the 1980s were coming back to, to, to be imposed on, on a European country. Mm. And yeah, in some ways, uh, I did warn about this in my book. And I told, they just didn't I, listen. They did. I had to say, yeah, uh, you know, I told you so. 
but the, the, the lesson, the, my warning, and it was funny actually, my book was picked up and I kept getting invitations from the, the Thatcherite Bruges group to come and talk because they thought, you know, yes, you're, you're another really, skeptic. You're another skeptic, but I wasn't a skeptic. I was, you know, I was, like, I was a, a Euro a realist who was kind of mm. warning them of, look, look you know, you, you built this project on very shaky foundations. Mm. And I think they realized, woke up to realize that, but too late, too late. Um, mm. And so Europe has become quite an unpopular project and it's seriously undermined. But going back to Brexit, I, I lived in the UK while it was happening. Uh, I watched with growing horror as public opinion seemed to, to sway and to move ever more towards uh, exit. Um, I looked and I saw how you know, rather right-wing populist political leaders were championing this. Boris Johnson and Michael Gove in particular, uh, and Nigel Farage. Boris Johnson was the most cynical of them all because he had no previous record of being a Eurosceptic. So this was all about settling scores within the Conservative Party. And I think he didn't think that he was going to win. So I think he was maneuvering so that, you know, if there was a high vote in favor of Brexit, then, and he had championed that, then he would have a, a good mandate yeah. Yeah, to, to challenge David Cameron in the event. I mean, even Cameron, the, the fact that David Cameron had instructed the civil service to make no contingency plans for exit indicates how arrogant and frankly how stupid uh, the prime minister he was uh, in, in making that gamble how reckless you know he's gambled the future of the country on on a on an issue that is about the internal domestic politics within the conservative party and he lost big time and as a result you know he's not only resigned as prime minister he's gone from from parliament he's resigned his seat he's mm. finished politically mm. Mm. I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of analysis of events like Brexit and institutions like the EU from a lot of different disciplinary backgrounds. I've been economists and political scientists. I, I hear that you integrate a lot of theory from those two disciplines into your analyses as well, but I'm wondering what is particular about uh, what you're bringing as an anthropologist to, these, mm -hmm. to analyses of these sorts of events. What is it about that theoretical framework or methodology that is different? Well, it, I mean, it's, you know, it sounds like a cliche to say that, but it's true that, you know, what, what anthropology brings to so many of these debates is, is a kind of an empirical grounding. I mean, we bring fieldwork and we bring ethnography. Um, and it's it, in a way that in most other, I mean, so the disciplines that spend most of their time writing about Europe, and there is a discipline now called European Union Studies, but it's largely dominated by international relations, political science, and now a little bit of sociology and economics, economics, yeah. economics in particular. And what these disciplines all lack, you know, is, is a real solid foundation of, of, of an ethnographic basis of some sort of empirical reference where they talk to key people um, and, and the key actors, and they're not just the elites, but, you know, like the actors on the ground. I mean, and it's really indicative how, as in the United States with uh, <laughs> the, the victory of Donald Trump, as in the case of the UK and Brexit, the pollsters, dominated by the, method, you know, the, the positivistic methods of, of political science mm. and, and, and polling, mm. got it wrong. And the only people who got it right were those political scientists who do ethnography. Because mm. if, you're, you know, if you're in connection with the people and the sentiment from the ground, the, you know, the view amongst the weeds, the view from below, then you, you're more in tune with what people are really thinking. But beyond that, you know, and then there's the other battery of, you know, what, what's the, I mean, anthropology is a, I think Donald, uh, Don, um, Hastings Donnan put it quite well, it's, it's a promiscuous set of methods, you know, we, you know, field work is a kind of code for, yeah, all kinds of approaches that involve, you know, interviewing, deep hanging out, reading newspapers, reading the grey literature, trying to map it against the, the kind of the academic literature, um, and borrowing heavily from other theories, but including anthropological theory. And mm. I, my background is, is in sort of political anthropology, so I, I found some of those kind of issues and debates. Yeah, I use people like you know Foucault and, and Marx and Gramsci and others to, to understand how power works, and uh, this is a good case in point. Mm. I think this is a good point to, one thing we also always ask is, you know, what, what would your definition of anthropology be for someone who, who, who hasn't studied anthropology, you know, someone from outside the discipline? How would you explain what anthropology is? 
social, cultural anthropology as yeah. opposed to, because yeah. I work in a, a four-field department where, you know, we, some, sometimes people think anthropology is, you know, bones and brains and, and monkeys. But, and some uh, of it is. Some of it is, yeah. But, but I, I mean, not I, what we do. It's always, a, I mean, it's hard, isn't it? This, this is something that all of us have this kind of challenge. You're at a party or something, a dinner party or at a party, <laughs> and somebody says, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm an anthropologist. And they say, ah. Oh, you know, so you you know you deal with DNA or with monkeys, and it's quite hard to to explain that no, that isn't what you do. You know, we deal with um, human cultures, and they say, oh, which period of history? You say, well, no, living ones now. Well, how do you do that? You say, well, the aim. I mean, I like the, the way Clifford Gitt puts it. You know, the aim is to try and see, get inside. Uh, uh, from you know, the, the native's point of view, as Malinowski put it, but then you know, Geertz's his idea that to try to get some sort of understanding of what life looks like from the perspective of the other, you know, the, the emic point of view, the inside of you, and contrast with the outsider point. I and mean, that's first and foremost, I think, what why what makes anthropology quite unique. We're always conscious of the fact that you know these the people that we're dealing with are actors with agency and consciousness who've got their own theories and their own take on, on reality in the world and that they live in worlds that are culturally as well as sort of materially constructed. Mm. And so what they do and what they say is a product of their history, their circumstances and their worldview. Elton Schauen. I love that that word that you know. I got that from Marx, but I know that people don't talk about worldview anymore. You know, they talk about ideology or cosmology or a mm. belief system. But I think, yeah, for me, that's that's one of the things that that's really attracted me to anthropology was that you were. It's the only discipline I know that seriously tries to engage with the world as it's apprehended by other people, and the only discipline as an undergraduate, I found it really empowering because, you know, whereas politics or history, you didn't really have any license to be an authority. You know, you, you, people would sort of say, yeah, you, you, we don't really know what, what, want to know your opinion, you know, study the facts, tell us what other writers say. But with anthropology, actually, you know, you are the vehicle through which you understand the other and the world. And so even as an undergraduate student, I felt that my views on certain things, yes, once mm -hmm. I'd summarized all the literature, rehearsed the arguments, given a balanced assessment, then what I felt and thought about it, or even my own perceptions, counted. Mm. And that mm. meant a lot. <laughs> mm. I'm wondering actually if we could shift towards mm. uh, one of your more contemporary projects. I think this is a good point at which to do so, given your description of what anthropology is. Mm. Uh, because more recently, you've also been taking anthropological methodologies and turning them upon the university itself yeah. as a place in which knowledge is produced in particular ways and according to particular cultures. So I'm wondering <coughs> if you could just talk us through a little bit about what that project is, how you came to have that focus, as well as your focus on institutions like the European Union. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, that just all began really when back in what 1990s, like 1999 or 98, I think I, I got foisted with this job that called head of department. You know, three-year sentence, three-year tour of duty <laughs> with with no time off for good good behaviour. And I, I didn't. I don't. To be honest, I don't. I've done it twice now, head of department job, and it's and it's like a it's a middle management job where you have responsibility, but and but and some authority, but no real power. So you're liaising between the, the, the university hierarchy and your own department. Mm -hmm. And previously, when you're just an ordinary lecturer, you're a kind of citizen, it's quite a flat, horizontal structure. Then you find yourself in this position where you, you, you've got to make recommendations about people's promotion, salaries, you've got to sort out the financial problems and, and the staffing, you know, like the human relation problem. So I thought the only way I'm going to survive is said, well, I got more and more interested. I started to learn about how the university works and how it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'll, I'll start you know, to make sense of this and to, to stay sane. I will treat it as an ethnographic project. Mm. So I started writing about it. And it was a time that sort of the 1990s that Britain had started to experiment with all these new systems of you know, we had for the first time, in, well, as you know, come around in like 1992, but every four years there was going to be a research assessment exercise, which you've got it in Australia, you've got it in New Zealand. You know, every academic, every uh, one, four or five years is going to be evaluated, assessed, graded, ranked on the basis of the, you know, their research mm -hmm. outputs 
and the, you know, the international quality of it. How do you measure the quality of research? So then they create national panels. And then we had a teaching quality assurance exercise and a departmental review. On the back of all of that critique about the university and the role that anthropologists can play in unpacking those dynamics, yeah. where do you think that there is space to push back against those shifts that are occurring within the universities? Like, how do you see anthropology being able to forward a project of resistance or of being able to make voices heard that counter those kinds of dynamics that are problematic, if at all? Well, yeah, if at all. I mean, it's like, how much power does a, you know, does a discipline have or, a, or a, even a, an individual? Um, you know, I, I think in, well, two answers. I think in one sense, the, the bigger question, the, the solution to the problem lies at a level that's way beyond the individual or the institution. It's a, you know, this is a question about national policy, and, and I think, you know, it has to be done at a, a like a, that higher level where the country has to, the government has to make a strategic decision. Do we want to invest in, in our universities and mm. higher education? And I think they need to see that again as, as a cultural treasure. I mean, you know, we have museums and we have the, you know, the repositories of all the things that we value most highly. Universities, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a library of knowledge and uh, one of the greatest assets that any country has and we're devaluing it. Um, and it's also the source of the training of the future generations of you know, leaders and so on. So at that level, uh, what anthropology can do at that, at that other level though is to, I, I think, just keep alive that, the, the tradition of, of critical thinking. Mm. There aren't, I mean, it's, it's a sad thing that many disciplines in a university are not geared to trying to encourage people to be critical thinkers. And it's, you know, the STEM subjects, for all their great value in, in uh, you know, developing areas of science and, not, and medicine and engineering and technology, um, they don't necessarily produce thinking, reflexive, critical, literate, uh, and you know, attuned um, individuals. I mean, we have this great discourse now about the relevance of, of particular subjects, and every discipline, like anthropology or sociology, is asked, well, what's your market relevant, you know, and parents now have bought into this narrative and they say, well, if my daughter studies at your university and studies anthropology, will she get a job? Mm. And the answer is, no, yeah, more likely to get a job than if you train in a highly specialised area of business studies or, or, um, or science where you, you know, if your employer wants and values independent, critical thinking, competent, um, motivated, reflexive individuals who, who can you know, problem solve and, and deal with issues and have got people skills and, and can deal with um, text and narrative and work out and, and, and have that, those cultural sensibilities. So, so I think, I mean, one of the challenges you've always got in anthropology is to continue to impress upon rather philistine uh, governments that why, why it matters and why you know, there's something quite special about an anthropological education. Whether anthropology has anything that's particular uh, in its strength about pushing back, I mean, it, as I said earlier, I, th I think uh, one of its great core values is that it, almost invariably, it's good at um, questioning received wisdom. Mm. And so, you know, an anthropological education equips people to th to, to not take things at face value, mm. to always be aware that there are multiple points of view, to always have an uh, appreciation of that the other might understand it differently, and to be sensitive to the fact that there's a, often a power, you know, that relations, social relations are power relations, and also that when people do things and act and behave, it's in a wider social, cultural, and historical context. And, uh, you know, put mm. all those things together, we're, we're trained to, appreciate the complexity of, of the social world and, mm. and hopefully to get some sort of competence in how you navigate through that. Mm. So anthropologists make, make good critical thinkers, I think. And, um, mm. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all true. I believe it all. I do, actually. <laughs>